Well, if you're in this what's next moment and you're trying to pivot your career, first an experiment is listening to yourself. What do I want to learn? What's the skill set that matter to me? And then again, don't just read a book. Try to build something, write something, do something with it. Welcome to Inside Out Career Design. In this show, we're obsessed with answering a single question. Is it possible to create an authentic, meaningful, and fulfilling life you love while building a successful and rewarding career? My name is Peter Axtell, and I'm here with Nicola Vetter. We're co-founders of the whatsnext.com Career Insights platform and creators of the groundbreaking Motivation Finder Assessment. Join us as we seek to transform suffering into joy for millions of people stuck and confused in their lives and careers. We'll share our insights, discoveries, and life lessons and talk with career experts, leaders, spiritual guides, psychologists, data scientists, coaches, anyone who might hold a strategy or answer to the age-old questions of what's next for me and what should I do with my life? Get ready to be inspired, motivated, and above all, to connect deeply with who you are and what you're meant to do with the time you've been given. If you like what you hear, share it with your friends or family and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. Are you trying to figure out what to do with your life? to figure out what to do with the precious time you've been given on this earth, or to figure out what only you as a remarkable and unique individual can bring into this world? If you are, please join us for one of our live and completely free online workshops where we cover different topics to help you figure out what to do with your life and career without wasting precious time taking wild guesses or risking it all. To save your spot in our next live and free workshop, go to whatsnext.com forward slash workshops. We can't wait to see you there. Again, that's whatsnext.com forward slash workshops. Our guest today is Rick Lindberg. Rick is a technical computer expert, freelance consultant for over 30 years, podcaster, team leader, and empathic listener who inspires courage and effective behavior in teams. He was awarded Consultant of the Year in 2013 by the eWork Group, the largest consultant network in Northern Europe. And he started his podcast, Results and Relationships, in 2014. So he is a bit ahead of us in that respect. Figuring out what's next requires empathic listening to yourself and to others, continually learning new skills and trying small experiments and measuring the results. That's why... We were so excited to talk with Rick. And in our conversation, we talk about what empathic listening means, why revenue is a critical factor that separates an idea you love from something that's viable, why it's important to find the courage to try things that might not work, how to make small experiments, how to step out of your comfort zone, and what to do for more security online. And now it's time to listen and learn from Rick. Welcome, Rick. Uh, you and I are fellow travelers on Seth Godin's workshop path, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation because you have a different way of exploring the questions that we are seeking to answer on the Inside Out Career Design Podcast, which is, what's next for my life, for my career, or even the bigger question, what should I do with my life? 
So, but before we dive into that, what was a what's next moment in your life where you had to sit down and had no choice but to figure out what's next for you? Oh, so often I do a lot of mistakes. So, <laughs> and I think I'm 48 years old right now. And when I started my career 30 years ago, I really wanted to hide behind computers because computers was easy to understand and easy to learn and use effectively. And I found people very confusing. But I quite early realized that that is why we're doing the wrong thing. We're doing it extremely well and uh, as asked of us, but you need to understand the people in order to understand, am I actually solving the right thing? And it took hard work to figure that out. Okay, how did you figure out? What, did some event happened or what? So again, I was a programmer or a technician and doing a lot of the tech work with the computings. And I realized that and, I, and I'm a log, logger kind of guy, so, and then working on analytics. So, of course, I did analytics on our projects. And I realized that we are always told to do this, say, on deadline on Friday, and then no one is using it for a week. So, why were we working so hard to ship by Friday when no one is watching it, trying it out for a week or so? And that's why I changed from only doing what I was told to start to ask, why are we doing this? What is this for? And who is this for? And all those questions that I later learned from Seth. So this is Seth Godin, just for our listeners yeah, who don't exactly. don't know him. So were you in the in a in a in a room with a lot of other programmers and were you the only person that decided to kind of ask what this is for? Was this something unique to you? Yeah, and at that time, I really feared tension. So I was very hesitant to bring those questions up. Yet, quite, I saw this pattern that we were doing what we were told and we were doing that exceptionally well, but we had understood the mission completely wrong uh, on a higher level. So usually costing a lot of calendar delays and usually a lot of cost and consulting time. And I realized this, I don't want to do this to my coworker. I don't want to do this to myself. Time is precious. So I had to step up being a manager and I was so awkward because back then I was like half the age of every manager around myself drinking Jolt Cola and uh, they were very, they were living a very different lifestyle. So I felt very insecure and very not enough. Yet I felt I had to face that tension. And you were the manager. Well, I became the manager because uh, I took responsibility for getting things done. I took a um, charge of, okay, if we say this, how do we know we're done? I don't just want to tick a box and say we're green on a project without actually talking to the one in need, the one with a vision, the one with a point of making it all. And then naturally you become in the driver's seat and it's not always fun. So you had to uh, crawl from behind your computer and meet with people and communicate with people rather than with code. What made you really feel that this is what you want to do? Thank you. That's a great question. Honestly, I rather still work with only computers, but I know that in <laughs> order to be effective, you need to do both. What does a life look like where every moment is a learning experience? And I'm quoting here from your website where you spoke up. In the IT industry, where I'm kind of born and bred, it is you need to learn. Technology you learned five years ago is quickly turning obsolete. And you can literally see 
all the systems you're building decaying in front of your eyes. So you need to relearn, you need to reevaluate, and you need to working on the skill sets that matter, both here and now for the current, if, if you're a consultant for your current client, but also to kind of peek into the future. What, what's happening right now? What, what do I need to learn in order to stay at top of the game? So Rick, from a motivational point of view of that we're very big on, on motivation, it could be said that you would be happiest being behind your computer, not having to interact with other people. In fact, we know people who are like that, and they are more suited to just being with their computer rather than having to deal with, with other people. And somehow you had some kind of motivation to get out of that comfort zone Someone must have taught you about empathy or relationships or something because you could have easily just stayed behind your computer. I'm sure you were doing a great job, but you didn't. Something inside you said, I'm going to get out of my comfort zone and have to deal with other people. How do you think that came about? Again, I think I did a lot of mistakes. The reason why I forced myself outside the comfort zone was respect for other people's time. I felt we were wasting team members' time by not understanding the problem we were here to solve. Um, so I think that was a huge motivator for me. And I'm, again, time is the only resource that is finite. So we should respect it for in ourselves as, uh, as well as everyone else. But also, and then going back to your question on empathy. So I had empathy with my team. And then still, I need to ask myself, why are my seniors, my higher ups, doing this to us and have empathy for their shoes? Because otherwise, we're not making change happen. Well, <clears throat> I have to just applaud you because. I think you are unusual in that way that many people would say, I'm just going to get the paycheck. It's, too, it's not my job to care. So I, I applaud you. And as I think about people who are trying to solve this problem, what, what should I do next with my life? Or how do I pick the, a good career for me? And something you said really piqued my interest. And it was in your relationship podcast, you've talked about the value of learning to solve hard problems. Let's talk about that. What are hard problems? Yeah, that's a good question. First of all, I think you need to add a few things to that. Great. Which is hard problems that your clients care about and that you care about. Because it's a lot of hard problems that don't lead you anywhere. Well, what I'm saying is I'm imagining that someone in our audience is thinking I'm something is not right and I I want to pick a a career I want to pick a direction where I will have some be paid well and have some semblance of security and what I interpret it from the learning to solve hard problems was that if you're a person who is inclined that that appeals to a person, it would appeal to me, frankly. Is that a strategy for someone to say, going forward in the future, and you're going to pick a some kind of a career that if you learn how to solve hard problems, that sounds like a pretty interesting strategy to me. I've never heard that. Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, totally correctly. And to add to that, that if you're daring to choose a hard problem, that is appreciated if you're if you're addressing and quite often the hard problem doesn't have to have a solution you, you if you can give a client just saying i take responsibility for working on this problem by two weeks from now i will give you my thoughts you're giving a lot of value to them because suddenly there's progress where other people shy away from that problem also i think if choosing a hard problem that you care about and someone else's care about is hard emotional work. We are all lazy. We want the instant pill. We want the simple solution. We want the low hanging fruits solution. But it's a billion of people doing that. So you need to actually dare, okay, 
what is a better way? How, how can I stretch myself for my people to do better than the easy work? Because the easy work, again, I think this is not just within the IT industry, but the easy work is quite often automated away. If you look at what a consultant is doing today versus 30 years ago, it is sliver after sliver of work is automated away. And that's why you need to stay focused on the hard work because that is not being automated away anytime soon. But the easy work, the work that someone can look up in a manual, that is being automated away every day. And how do I learn to solve hard problems? Yeah. Where I would I that, start? That, that is the question of the lifetime. And I think <laughs> that is some, something we all work on throughout our life. But I think that is being willing to admit we, this might not work, to admit to ourselves that I do not ho hold all the answers, but try to do something, do an experiment. And then I, the mistake I do again and again is I do the experiment in my head. I think I know what you want. Uh, and in my head, everything looks green and lush and easy. Uh, so the, the trick is actually do an experiment and then put it in your hand. Say, hey, I made this. Does this work? I believe you are here trying to get there. And I believe this might help. Let me know how it went. What would an experiment look like? Say someone in our audience, you're saying, okay, Rick, what would an experiment look like? How do I do that? Well, if you're in this what's next moment and you're trying to pivot your career, first an experiment is listening to yourself. What do I want to learn? What's the skill set that matter to me? And then again, don't just read a book, try to build something, write something, do something with it. And then what I find in myself is I read a book and I get all engaged and oh, well, this is wonderful. This is what I want to do. But once I start to actually reach out a hand and help someone, I realize, no, this is not for me. But as long as I keep it in my head, I don't learn that. It's everything is easier in our head. But then also asking ourselves, who do I want to serve? If I help my clients with this, who do they become? And again, if I believe that niche is going to be automated away, I might find myself on a very thin line with very few clients to help. Not fuel, um, it's not sustainable for me to keep learning that skill. Then. And again, it's really hard to know that. We do a lot of experiments that might not work. But by doing those, we also figure out, oh, this is really what I'm meant to do right now. These are really the people that I can help right now. So was there a story of where you read a book or read a blog post or saw something and you decided to do an experiment and then uh, it, and it didn't work? Is there a specific story you have? Countless. Um, <laughs> again, I think what, by calling it a, an experiment, we're giving ourselves permission to fail. We're giving ourselves permission to say, this has a time frame where I call quits. I'm not going to pursue this if it's not as helpful to my people as I believe it should be. And um, I've been a YouTuber. I try to help. I'm a computer gamer and I really believe in the power of game and the power of play and stuff like that. So I tried to help people with esports before esports was a thing. What and is nobody that? Nobody cares. What is esports? Esports, e that is basically when you compete in tournaments uh, over on, on computer games. And it is a billion dollar industry. It's a lot of money now on that. You, I'm quite sure that you've heard of Fortnite and other computer games like that. The, I was on YouTube 10 years ago talking about this where no one was paying attention. Uh, and I failed. But I did an experiment because I believed uh, at the time there was this mismatch between screen time is bad and I tried to say, well, actually, if you're learning a craft like you're doing right now, Peter, with video and switching and a lot of cool things, 
if you're a streamer talking about video games, you can learn craft like that and then you can apply that in another career. If you learn to be disciplined and train, train something, you can apply that in a different career. And so I really try to help the young generation to say, just playing more games will not give you what you want. But by doing this intentionally, you're picking up a lot of other skill sets that you can apply elsewhere for the effect you want. And now you have streaming is a thing. A lot of people have a very healthy career doing that. And a lot of people realize that it's not actually the screens that are bad, it's the algorithms nudging us, dopamine hits and stuff like that, that, that are bad. And that we're most of us is sitting still. I'm standing right now that we're doing this interview. But a lot of us is sitting still in front of the screen and that is really bad. So I try to advocate that, learn to see the difference and embrace the good things and then how can you work around the bad things and that didn't work and i tried writing books that is not my strength side even if people try to help me i'm not a good author so uh, i've done a lot of experiments that didn't go where i wanted but you but you took action and and you tried experiments. exactly and i learned a ton from it Another reason why I started to do another YouTube was because I was afraid of the camera. And the YouTube channel didn't take off, but I dared to work outside my comfort zone to turn confident on the camera. And in the pandemic and these years, that's been a really powerful skill to have, to be confident when presenting and using the camera, for example. So I think the important thing to talking to your audience where we're doing these career shifts, we don't know when we're in the midst of an experiment, all the lessons we will learn there and how we will apply them. But by not taking an action, you, you learn so much less. Wow. So there are okay. several points. I, I just need to go back. One quick question. So you're saying you're standing right now while we are sitting. Yeah. What's, what's the benefit of standing when you do video podcasting or, or video conferencing even? Uh, good question. I stand 100% when I'm in front of my computer. And so I don't distinguish it. When I started podcasting maybe 10 years ago, I got a lot of feedback that I have no energy in my voice. In my real life, I hear a lot that I give energy and to other people and stuff like that. And the people who were listening to my podcast kept saying, why can't you be yourself? Uh, and then I also learned that standing up helps, but that's not why I do it because I'm standing up because I sit a lot in front of the computer. And if I would be sitting all that time, I would be sitting too much. Mm -hmm. I, I actually heard sitting is the new smoking so yeah, so good I for think you good for is, you <laughs> it is dangerous but again it is we shouldn't look at sitting still in isolation if you have a healthy lifestyle and move a lot sitting still is good for you but it if it's all you do it's not good for you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now another point so you said you forced yourself to be on camera, which is not a natural thing for you to do. But when you started with YouTube 10 years ago, you forced yourself and thus you became more camera confident. Now, this is a this is a skill to do to go to the, I would say, the extreme, something that's out of your comfort zone. How do you do that? What is needed? What skills are needed to go beyond your comfort zone? Oh, I don't know if I'm the master to answer that. But in this case, what helped me was um, I have a daughter, she's seven years old right now. And uh, I realized before we got her that She's gonna, going to grow up to have a thousands photos of her gorgeous mother 
and zero photos of me because whenever someone brings up a camera, I hide or I'm the one taking the shot. And I realize I don't want to do this to, to our kid. Uh, so I use that as a motivation to actually practice it. Also, I really believe in be kind to yourself. Courage isn't something you wait for. It is something you get through practice, through action. And again, you need to pay attention to yourself because outside comfort zone isn't natural for us. It's something we fear, something we hide away from, something that is pushing us back. But if we don't do that, comfort zone is also shrinking. Every year it's shrinking if I'm not doing something intentionally. And that thought scares me a lot. So I use that to remind myself that I don't want less freedom yet next year than I have right now because I'm afraid of something. So that's why I'm using that. I'm reminding myself that I'm willing to face some slight discomfort right now or scared shitless to, so, sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but I quite often feel like that. And then, okay, but this is temporary. I don't want this to diminish my life going forward. This is a great point about if I don't get out of my comfort zone, my co I'm going to start shrinking. I'm going to start contracting. That Then that means you're going to start limiting your options and what you see and, and everything else. Nicola. And it, it all goes back to motivation again, right? You, you illustrated that very beautifully, saying, this is my motivation. So my daughter gets to have some images of me. Wonderful. Now, the last point that I wanted to <laughs> come back to is failure, because you mentioned I failed. How would it be to reframe failure? Because I always say we are trying, just you said as well, experimenting. And if you don't put this word failure in your mind, but say it's an experiment and I learned. Yeah. Yeah, I love the kindness that you're portraying here, Nicola. And I think you're absolutely right. The, re the reason I'm using the word failure is because at the end of the day, I'm a data guy. I want something measurable. If I had an intention, I want to be able to say, did it work for that intention? Uh, and I think if I use the word, I learned, I, I'm not embracing that, no, it didn't work for what the intended purpose is. Um, but that is, after I realized it didn't work, and even if it did work, I need to ask myself, what's the lessons learned here? Because if it did work, and say, Peter here what, did all the heavy lifting, I can't take the credit, I can't say I learned something, because without him, I can't repeat this. So even if it works, we still need to evaluate and say, what did we learn? Can we take credit for the success? But I, even if, we, if it failed, we need to ask ourselves exactly the same questions, exactly with the same care and kindness. Beautiful, yes. I was listening to William B. Irving, I think it is, who, who's written a book on Stoicism. And it was amazing when he said the Stoics used to set themselves up intentionally to have little small failures so they could experience what it was like to fail. We're just naturally not inclined to want to do that, but they were talking about this 2,000 years ago. It's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're, it's humbling to be human. And I think myself, <laughs> I... If we're not, I think it's a good practice to talk about failure and to set you up for fail because otherwise you're not doing hard enough work. If you, if I have a day that's only successful, I haven't been all that I can be for my people. You speak about asking the right questions. How do you know that you are asking the right questions and how do you get to the right questions? That's a great question. Math <laughs> question, very meta. Uh, I think first it is embracing reality that most people around us, most the people around anyone who's listening to this right now, they want easy answers. 
But an easy answer isn't a hard question, isn't something that is really worthwhile. If someone can look that up on a web search or in a book, uh, it's still helpful. Please help enlighten the people around you. But it's way more powerful if you can ask yourself, why did they ask for that answer? What's the point of asking that right now? What's the perspective that they're coming from? And then, then we're leaning into empathy again. So if we're only focusing in on an answer, we're limiting what might happen with the connection we're making right now on whatever topic we're talking about. So you're saying that it, someone asks a question and you, rather than saying, okay, here is the answer, you're going deeper than that and asking yourself the question, why is that person asking the question in the first place? Exactly. And this can take a second and then you give them the answer. The, the answer I believe you're looking for is four to two. But then if you only blurb that up because you read that in a book, it's a big, um, you might disconnect to why they're asking. You might disconnect on, you might have a better answer for their question, but they're not there yet, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I love how you put others first and how you, how you describe that the relationship is actually at the core of everything, also of asking questions. I always say, if you ask the right questions, then the answers will come naturally. Yeah, yeah. And, and if you ask, ask the right questions, suddenly it's about design and it's about a lot of other more powerful things versus, and again, we are human. We want easy answers. We want something to feel. Uh, if I misunderstand you, I'm going to feel ashamed. So I'll give you a vague answer that can't be wrong. But is that really helpful? Or is it my, uh, I didn't understand that. It, are you asking for this and then turning that on the specific? Suddenly we connect or we realize, no, we're not nowhere near in connect, connecting on this. Let's talk some more. This is a, another great point. This whole idea, someone asks you a question, the human thing is go, okay, here's the answer. I've got the answer. Here it is. And you're saying, if you just get to moment two, you know, Daniel Kahneman thing, a moment two, we call, and think, wait a minute, what if I just held off for two seconds and ask myself that question, why are they asking that question? Rick, people don't normally think that way. I think that's a beautiful point. I just want to say that. So you advise people to ask, what have I done and how well have I done it? So what do you mean by that? Do you mean how well have I done it in my own view or someone else's view? What do you mean by that? Uh, that's a beautiful question too. I think it depends on the context you're saying that. If you're talking about, for example, you want to learn a skill set, we can read a book, we can follow a YouTube a tutorial, we can do a lot of things. But at sometimes you need to be a bit able to embrace reality and say, actually, did I learn? Did I become better? Did I, can I actually do something for someone right now? Um, if you're looking, if you're a recruiter and you're looking at a resume, you really want to figure out what did this individual do? Not the team, not the company, not the, the organization, but this individual, what did they do and how well did they do that? And once you learn to formulate that yourself, suddenly a lot of other people can help you remark on your behalf. Oh, Nicola, she can do that because I know what she does. I understand what she's doing really well. And quite often we don't think about that. We, we are so busy. Either, like you said earlier, I want to show my worth and give you a quick answer. So instead of saying, actually, I came up with this answer by daring to face this tension, daring to think about this problem. And I'm a bit uncertain in my uh, assertion right now, but I believe this will help. Suddenly other people see what's going on and they real oh, the confidence in this answer really rose right now. It just, just instantly makes me think of Brene Brown and vulnerability. 
which I know you're a fan of Brene Brown, and it's so beautiful when she says that vulnerability, we all think we kind of are fooling everybody else. <laughs> and of course, we're not. People can, can see that. So how does this help someone who's looking for what's next in their life and career? Let's drill down a little bit on this concept. Yeah, if we could then spe specifically talk about how well did I do it and what did I do, then if you're not taking any action, if you're not creating something that might be helpful for someone else, start there. And I think there we also need to dare to embrace our own perspective, and that can be scary in itself. And with perspective, I mean combining what you've learned so far. If you're coming from school, did you read any extra books that no one else did? Do you have a hobby that no one else did? Can you combine those two into something? And then dare to extend the hand to help someone. And try to help them from their perspective. Try to actually ask yourself, I believe you are here trying to get here. And then I believe this might help you. And that might be extending a hand to help them carry. That might be writing something. That might be giving them an inspiration or a nudge. That might be just being uh, going to Benny Brown, being vulnerable. I feel like this when I'm walking this path. Suddenly, when you have those conversations with people, everyone around you thought they were alone and suddenly you can talk about it. So the, there's no too small experiment you can do. I, I used to say that sometimes just forwarding an email, bold marking one word, that is sharing your spe specific. That is what matters in this message. Suddenly you help someone else see, oh, now I understand why we're running around in circles here. So there's n you cannot do two small experiments. But it goes back to, Peter, what you said earlier with failures, that if you're only doing small experiments, you should try to do bigger things. Because every now and then you need to do an ex ex um, assertion and uh, have a theory that actually didn't work. Because that, that's how you grow. That's how you relearn. That brings us also to the other question that you suggest people should ask. Who cares deeply about what I have done? I think they are closely connected. Can you expand on that? Yeah. Um, so a mistake I do almost every day as a cybersecurity nerd. I talk about a lot of things people don't care about. They, it is too complicated. The danger is too real, too scary to think about. And uh, I'm too dependent on my tools, my software, my internet, everything. So if I cannot have empathy and start to connect about what matters to the individual I'm talking to, I'm totally not connecting. I'm, I'm just freaking people out and they stop listening. But if people knew what you know, especially in the in the field of cybersecurity that you just mentioned, then it would be invaluable if they could just pick your brain and, and, and hear what you have to say to keep them safe. So what is it that people could do in that space? Uh, I'm, ha I'm happy to share advice. Uh, in a minute. But first, I think you asked a really important question. And I think nobody cares about what I know. No one who's listening to this right now, you have a ton of valuable information in your head, but you need to figure out how to relate to the other person first, how to connect on that topic first. Otherwise, it's just another boring PowerPoint that no one looks. Otherwise, you're investing a ton of effort doing something that I believe is better, that isn't being read, isn't being used for what it's for. And I think we have that responsibility to whenever we communicate to someone to actually evaluate, do we appear to be connecting on this? If I'm sharing a guidance and are they acting on that guidance? Or 
are they asking for the same advice tomorrow as well? Then oh, I'm happy to talk cybersecurity stuff too, but <laughs> I think you asked two questions there. That's really important. <laughs> That's true. I always, I, I just think that especially if you are out there trying to find a job or trying to make a career change and everything happens online these days, how can you stay safe with all the spam emails coming in with hackers and what do you suggest on a very, very small, not for business, on, on a very small level to individuals today? Oh, first of all, the most important thing you, I, I recommend everyone to do is to turn on multi-factor authentication. And what that means is if you're online today, you, you have a user ID and you have a passphrase to your email, to perhaps uh, a job board or a, every tool you're using usually have a username and a password. The, the scary thing with those two, though, is that those are easily copied by someone else. If you're sitting in an internet cafe, um, someone might be listening into the network and grabbing those, or someone might be filming you from the security camera and then they can just mimic your keyboard typing with their own hands and they, they pretend to be you. So the multi-factor authentication then is a third thing, perhaps an app on your phone. So after you log in, you're also forced to do something on your phone in order to validate, yes, this is me, Nicola, trying to log into the site. Um, and every service you're using right now, anyone who's listening to this, look up multi-factor authentication and enable that for that service. And if we're looking specifically at job seekers, sadly, it's a lot of sharks out there on the net that target people who are looking for jobs because they are vulnerable, they are in a position of needs, so they pretend to be a job ad. It's so easy to, to look on LinkedIn and other places to know what's relevant for an individual. And it is all automated. You, you're getting a ton of emails from people, from, from what looks like people, perhaps in this case, uh, looking for to hire you, but it's just a script. It's just automated. They don't care about you. It's just people like this, send them this in order to grab your credentials so they can blackmail you. They can use your ac accounts to get into the company or other things. And multi-factor authentication isn't a cure-all, fix-all but it's really a big first step that is quite easy to do. So to recap, it's not enough to just have your username and a password. You now, which is what many banks require, you now yeah. even need the third po uh, point, which is, well, getting, getting a question on your phone, for example, is this really you? Yeah, exactly. Yeah? And you can do that with Everything you can do that with LinkedIn and Facebook and wherever yeah, exactly, you go. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, 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 everything is a very tall order, but I would say ninety-nine percent of what's being used by people listening to this right now, LinkedIn for sure. Facebook I don't use, but I'm quite sure they have it too. Good. Good to know. Thank you so much Please for this. Please do that. That's <laughs> urgent. Uh, and again, people don't care about you specifically. It's just because it's easy to automate things, and eventually, and you'll you'll eventually you'll get caught in someone's net. That's great. We got some bonus content there. I hadn't anticipated that, but it's super useful. Thank you for that. An interesting strategy that you suggest to ask is, who do I know that can teach me something right now? I'd love to know what your thinking is behind that. Um, so I lead to com communities of people who are smarter than me. And that has helped me my career immensely. I, that's not why I did it. I did it because I care and I want to help. But together, we're smarter. When you say you lead to communities, 
Can you expand a little bit on that? What kind of communities? How did you get to lead those communities? Because the others are smarter than you? <laughs> That's not possible that they're smarter than Rick. That can't be. Thank you. But yeah, <laughs> I, I, I think I, I learned from Steve Jobs that if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. And I think um, I like being with smarter people. That's why I'm here, because I've learned from you, Peter, for a year now or, some, or something. So I really believe that. Uh, and these two communities, I'm a consultant. I've been consulting for 30 years and freelancing for 10, 12. And um, I just cared about, again, helping people in vulnerable spots, helping people actually not waste time leveling up in something that doesn't matter. So I lead a community for agile consultants and another for cybersecurity consultants. And I find those two communities so interesting because they are so, so different. In agile, it's self-forming teams, trust first. Uh, it's a very fast work. And I, and I love these people. And in cybersecurity, it's zero trust. It's a lot. It's very different. And both do valuable, important work. It's not that one is better than the other, but it's a really interesting dynamics. It's an honor to be part of both because their worldviews are so different. Beautiful. Now we touched on the cybersecurity part. Can you just quickly tell our audience what does agile mean? That's in everybody's mind and 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 words these times. What does it mean? Uh, agile is just a word for how we can collaborate and work together. And uh, I think the comparison is quite often waterfall, which is you have a set budget and you have a set of months, uh, um, and then you paint a picture. This is where we want to be. And then we backtrack from there and hope it works. It's a big bet waterfall versus agile. It's um, you're very much closer to business and you're saying, okay, what can we do this week that matters for the business? And then we make a new choice on usually in, in sprints of two weeks or something like that, but we're always, and then we're making a demo. So we are not, um, in a traditional project led project, you have a project manager who has a checklist and wants there, there's dying to signal green on the checklist and they're not willing to face any uncertainties in do I understand this checklist goes back to Peter's questions on questions there in agile it's like you're very close to the person you're serving and you're talking okay what can we do with the amount of effort we can afford this week what can we do with that what matters most to you and how can I limit the work to chunks that we can get done so you can say thumbs up. We did what we set out to do. I'm really looking forward to this next question, Rick. You said that it's your job to position yourself where you have options that help others and yourself. So what are some examples and how would that apply to someone trying to figure out What's next? So many thoughts run, run around when you say that. I think, first of all, uh, something that fooled me for mo many of my years, and I still fall into that trap every now and then, is I want to live a life of passion, and I, we should be passionate in everything we do. Uh, and and of course, I think you should love what you do and you should love the people you're choosing to serve. But passion don't equal revenue. But you need to figure that out. That is your job. Because if you can't make revenue, you're not making sustainable change for those you're here to serve. And I think passion can easily lead us astray. Again, if passion can, this is fun, I'll keep doing this. And then instead of actually helping the people who's right in front of me right now, I'd rather turn into a theory and create something in my head 
or on my computer or something, but it's not actually helping people because then I'm putting myself off the hook for two years. It's going to take two years to do this thing. And I'm having the time of my life. Then I'm facing a brick wall when I'm trying to ship it and realize, oh, I really didn't understand my target people here. Inaction is the enemy we have. The only enemy we have. That's what you say, right? Yeah, I, love I that think one. action is so important. And again, I fear action. I rather read a book any day of the week. But that isn't helpful if that's all I do. I love reading. But if it's all I do, it's not going to change anything for anyone. Rick, you inspire others to bring out the best in themselves and others. That's so beautiful. Can you speak more about that and how it helps someone who is trying to figure out what's next? First of all, we need to inspire ourselves, and that's not always easy. But then goes back to if you can try to be self-aware about why does this matter to the one I'm trying to help right now, then we can get inspiration for that. Or, or again, we get, as Nicola was saying, then we learn, actually, that's not my cup of tea. That's not my strength, or that's, I might have the strength or the skills, but this is boring me right now. I don't see any level up that's worthwhile pursuing here right now. Uh, and then I think if we dare to do that, then we learn and we re position ourselves as we're going along because we're learning more about ourselves as we're leaning into the problem. Mm -hmm. So inspire yourself first. That has a lot to do with motivation again. What is it yeah. to know? What is it? What motivates me? Because that's what inspires me to bring out into the world. And if you could know that about others, then you could probably easily inspire others as well. Would you agree? Yeah, totally. And again, I think we might have a great tool or a great idea or something that's really helpful. But if it's not inspiring to someone else, they're probably not going to care. If they don't have a light bulb moment themselves saying, actually, we could use this like that. That's going to be awesome for her. Probably not going to pick it up and do their part of the work that needs to happen. How do you inspire yourself? Or how does one inspire themselves? Stick with you first. <laughs> yeah, I think, again, to be kind to yourself. I, I'm not inspired 100% of my time, uh, and that's okay. But over a work week, I need to ask myself, did I solve the right problem for the people that matter, that I care about? Um, did I make a promise to someone a client or a customer or a, or a friend or a family member and held to that so they can trust me next week too. And, and that is very inspiring and scary. Making promises to people is scary, but it is how we learn. And that is very inspiring to me. Beautiful. Now, did you want to say something? I could I'll just talk question. to Rick all day if you can, but I will. We won't be able to, but anyway, I just I just wanted I just wanted to go back to the community that we spoke about before, those two communities. Now you seem to be a big believer in masterminds, offering some yourself. So I, I just wanna be clear we spoke about communities. Are those the two masterminds that you spoke about? No, not in my worldview. Uh, I I know there's countless of books explaining this better than I do. Uh, for me, masterminds is a small group of people, maybe four to eight people who meet regularly and talk about a specific topic or relationships or business or whatever we care about. Um, a community is a bigger thing perhaps hundreds of people, uh, usually again,
people who are in that community need to care about something. You, there need to be some, something that knits you together. And that's why, again, there's very different worldviews on the agile workspace and the cybersecurity workspace. If I said, this is for everyone, every consultant, please join, I think people are going to go, why would I do that again? I don't connect to these people. So uh, a community needs to have something we care about, something that matters, something that we can laugh about. How, can, how come the people don't see this? That is a typical community, community thing versus a mastermind that is relationship over time. Quite often you invest in trying to help each other. And again, there's great books read, uh, written on the topic, but basically it is meet regularly, care about people in that group, try to help them get to where they're trying to go and try to p poke hole to their illusions. Sometimes that's what we need friends for. So when I understand you right, if I understand you right, then a community is a larger group of people that are looking in the same direction with one specific topic, whereas a mastermind is a smaller group, preferably with very diverse people that bring in all kinds of diverse aspects that can help you move forward. Yeah, I, and I love that you mentioned diversity because I think in a community, every individual is uh, diverse. We're more unique than uh, we are aware of, even if we're there because we have exactly the same role or something at work. But I think when you talk about a small group in a mastermind, being of different age group, different everything is really important. Different niches in business, uh, everything. The, the more different you can be, the power, more powerful uh, a mastermind will be. But again, with a community, you, of course, when I see diverse, uh, we, when we talk about gender and stuff like that, that doesn't really matter in a community because if you're there because you love cybersecurity, that is why you're here and your age or anything else doesn't really matter because you know why you're there. Um, but in a mastermind, you should keep the diversity and perhaps not all be cybersecurity uh, consultants because it's going to be a very different kind of mastermind experiment. Experiments. Yeah, we have a we have a mastermind running for three years now. And it's just beautiful because the trust builds slowly, slowly, slowly. But now I think if something happened to, to me or Peter, we know where to reach out, to whom to reach out to besides dear friends. Now, a question for our listeners here. How would you suggest that people can find a mastermind that could give them that kind of comfort? Great question. Uh, I think you need to lead one yourself. Don't wait to find someone. Uh, I think um, you need to be kind to yourself. The first you host probably won't work. The second you host probably won't work. But perhaps the third one, now you know more who you want to invite. Now you know more about how you want to do it. Uh, so be kind to yourself, but gather some people and make an assertion saying, over Friday lunches, I want to meet here for 60 minutes and let's talk about business. Let's talk about how to copyright. Let's talk about how to break into whatever and uh, start there. Exactly. Uh, and then, of course, I think if you invite a lot of uh, people for free over lunch, you're also intentionally choosing who would show up. If you pay for a high-level mastermind group, 
you will be joining a lot of other people who are paying a high fee to join a high-performing mastermind group. So, um, and I'm not saying everyone can afford that because that is not the reality. So start with gather a, a people you find smarter than you around you saying, hey, can we do it like this? Would that work? But um, I think I recommend everyone to pay to be in, ma in the mastermind group, to lead a paid mastermind group, and to be in a free mastermind group. And I think they are very different, and we learn different lessons in them. But it's really, really start meeting people over time. And this goes back to what we started to talk about when we joined. You won't know which of these experiments work. You'll, you'll kiss a lot of frogs that didn't work for you. But you need to, to do that, dare to do that anywhere, even if it's emotional work, even if it's scary. Say, hey, can we meet and talk like this? And also put yourself off the hook that if you say, well, let's meet for five weeks in a row or five months in a row, once a month or something, and then you know, okay, actually, this isn't the group that I was hoping for. So let's dismantle the group and then perhaps keep these two people and do something different. And then don't just reboot it and pretend. Uh, say, no, actually, I think we need to change it like this and allow yourself to keep these two that actually resonated with what you're trying to accomplish. Well, I think that one of the big themes of this conversation has been do lots and lots of experiments and, and, and dare to fail. So as we're, at the, as we're at the end, Rick, is there anything that we didn't touch on that you really want our audience to know or some pearls of wisdom you could leave our audience? Yeah, again, in this what's next, I've been working with prediction for 30 years uh, using software to do that, and we don't know. It's really hard to know what will work. So dare to do something. And today, don't wait too long. Uh, and uh, if that is taking a different walk when you go home, if that is daring to talk to someone for a neighbor or the barista, the barista is usually a good person to train on if you're scared to talk to people. Um, do something differently. And suddenly you're starting, to, your brain is starting to behave differently. You're thinking other thoughts because you're doing something differently. And through that, something totally surprising might emerge that you find priceless. Yeah, and again, with empathy, it is not everyone want to be talked to. The, and the faster you can learn to see that, the better you become for both of you. Uh, and also another recommendation on that topic is everyone, uh, I'm a speaker, and everyone want to talk to the speaker on stage. And then you're stuck in a queue of people trying to talk to the speaker on stage. Talk to the helper. Help the helper. To talk to the organizer. Talk to someone else who don't have a queue. And once you connect on with them, then they might introduce you to the speaker. They, so basically, don't go for the big fish. Go for someone in, that is in the niche that you want to be in and the, with the skill set that you want to be with or doing what you want to do, if that makes sense. Mm, absolutely. Wow, what a beautiful... Beautiful ending, inspiring, and I think this was a great time we've Thank had you, together. Rick. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's a pleasure talking to you. We hope you enjoy this interview. The biggest takeaway for me was the idea of learning how to solve hard problems as a way to stand out and show your value, but also the importance to experiment, 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 and track results. And my biggest takeaway was not to put I failed in your mind, 
and instead replace it with I learned. Because language is generative. And I got the confirmation again that our relationships with others are at the core of everything. Very enlightening was also how easily someone can steal your username and how a multi-factor authentication can go a long way to protect yourself from cyber threats. I'm going to do that right away. To learn more about Rick, head to whatsnext.com forward slash 17, where we share the transcript, links, and more. Again, that's w-h-a-t-s-n-e-x-t dot com forward slash 17. And if you like what you've heard, share it with someone you care about and subscribe, rate, and review our Inside Out Career Design Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. Thanks so much for joining us here today. We'll see you next week for another episode, same time, same place.